another card show come and gone, and in the light of some fantastic dollar deals, $5 fines, and $10 diamonds, I also witnessed the very best and very worst of the sports card hobby, no less than an hour apart, a microcosm of it all, in a little hotel meeting room. Episode 11 described the last round of dollar box treasures found in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which included an autographed 1951 Bowman Eddie Pellegrini and a 1933 Gowdy Jumbo Jim Elliott. This latest show was in Bentonville, Arkansas, a town most famous for being the international headquarters of Walmart. When the largest company in the world is nearby, so are the high-dollar employees. So this show was pretty flashy for such a small space, and more four- and five-figure deals than one might expect for a fairly small show in Arkansas. Digging right into the cheap bins, I scored two dollar deals right away. The first was this 2018 Topps Chrome Rookie Blue Wave Refractor Autograph of Scott Kingery. In the midst of fantastic overproduction, cards like this are Topps' way of faux manufacturing scarcity. I'm not certain it works. The title of the card is exhausting enough. 2018 Tops Chrome Rookie Blue Wave Refractor Autograph. 18 syllables, but it's still in the bargain bin. The Blue Wave Refractors are serial numbered out of 150, and this is card number 83. Kingery was a hot prospect and made his debut with the Phillies in 2018 after signing a six-year, $24 million contract before ever stepping foot on an MLB diamond. It didn't go well after that. He played every day in 2018, and well enough, I suppose, but after some struggles and a shoulder injury, he was outrighted to AAA Lehigh Valley and has remained there for the past three seasons, where his performance suggests he's not coming back to the bigs. There's always a chance that Kingery gets called back up, but it seems like he missed his shot. Fingers crossed, Scott. Fingers crossed. Speaking of players that missed their shot, in the same bin of discarded Never Was Rookies was this 2016 Topps clearly authentic rookie autograph card of Jake Thompson. Some of you may remember the clear beverage fad of the early 90s. Crystal Pepsi, clear beer, Zima. Crazy times, truly. Well, how about clear baseball cards? I applaud the creativity here and the boldness to try something new. It's worth a buck just for that. But not much more. Jake Thompson came to the Phillies in 2015 from the Rangers in the big trade that saw Cole Hamill's departure just days after pitching a no-hitter, ending an era for the Phillies pitching staff. Thompson was up and down to AAA a bunch of times, appearing in 10 games in 2016, 11 games in 17, and 1 game in 18, before getting sent to AAA to stay. He signed a few other minor league deals, and played a stint in the Korean League and the Mexican League too, but his MLB career is pretty much over. I like cards like this because even though Jake Thompson didn't have a big career, he was good enough to pitch in the big leagues, and that means he was really good. And so his autograph is welcome here. Also, I hope to be able to tell my grandkids about the clear baseball card fad, and then tell them about clear beer and really blow their minds. Additional dollar deals included Zach Eflin's 2022 Green Foil, number 65 out of 499 which is actually kind of cool and light, and a banger of a Jimmy Rollins 98 Bowman Chrome Prospect card. Rollins is a borderline Hall of Famer. Time will tell, so this one could be worth big bucks one day. This day, it was worth one buck. The $5 fines were plentiful too. This 1952 Bowman Jack Lork came out of a mixed box of vintage. It's a high number, number 251, and in beautiful condition if a bit off-center. Lucky Lork, as he was known, came over from the Giants after the 51 season and only played two seasons with the Phils. A good collecting rule is that when you see a vintage high number at a good price, you buy it. The dealer threw in the Ken Silvestri because it was severely creased across the center. Two Bowmans for five bucks? Count me in. And taking my own advice, I found this 1967 Topps Tony Gonzalez, also a high number. We'll discuss the 67 high numbers in a future episode, But if you find them in good condition and for five bucks, sweet, merciful crap, buy it. I left for a few minutes to grab a hot dog and a drink. Upon returning to the floor, I was at a vintage table thumbing through some 53 Bowman colors, 
looking for a Dell Ennis to replace mine, which is in pretty poor condition. I found one, too. Excellent all the way around, but not mint. Just the way I like it. He was asking $80 for it. A very strong price. As I was pondering what to offer, and checking comps on my phone, as is the way these days, a man next to me asked to see some 52 tops. He was about 50, with buzzed short hair, and walked with a cane, nursing a leg injury. The dealer let him flip through the stack, after which the man threw the cards down, perhaps too forcefully for cards that weren't his, but also not in any way that put the cards at risk for damage. He said, I'll give you ten bucks for the stack. Now the stack was about ten cards from what I could estimate, and a dollar each for 52 tops cards, even beat up commons, is a pretty insulting offer. And these were nice cards, worth at minimum ten bucks each. I wasn't sure what his angle was, and thought maybe they might be friends and it was a joke. The dealer, perhaps gruff from having his cards mistreated, chirped back, learn some f***ing respect, and he scooped up his cards atop the case. Well, that escalated quickly. Why was the buyer so disrespectful, and why didn't the dealer just say no thanks and take his cards back? It became so ugly so fast, and for no reason. The buyer came back. I don't respect cards. Do you want the ten bucks? The dealer came back again, this time at full bore, and the two just started screaming at each other. You mother you get the just cards, get out of never come to my All of this over a few baseball cards and the dangerous combination of price, value, and self worth. The guy limped off as the dealer sought out security, and there I was still holding the fifty three Bowman Del Ennis at an empty dealer booth. I wanted the card, but his $80 asking price was about three times the current market value. It didn't seem the right time to ask this guy for a discount, so I put the card on the top of the pile, put the pile back in his case, closed the case lid, and moved on, puzzled at the whole encounter. Approaching four hours into the show, I had been through most of the inventory. I was going through a collection of sagging boxes, overstuffed and overflowing with cards, and each box marked with a diamond. Everything was ten bucks. All kinds of stuff was in there. Clemens rookies, modern serial refractors, vintage stars in various conditions, groups of unopened packs, you name it. Thumbing through here and there, I stumbled across a fabulous ten dollar diamond. A 1911 T205 George Paskert. Paskert's nickname was Doty. He played for the Phils from 1911 to 1917. He just barely missed the 1912 National League MVP award, and was a major piece of the 1915 Phillies who won the team's first pennant. Doty would be my first T205 card, and the oldest single card in my collection. I worried he might be lonely. Remarkably, though, in the same box, I came across another T205 $10 diamond. This time, it was Pat Moran. Moran came to the Phillies in 1910 and was the backup catcher for a few years. He morphed into a player coach and was the primary force in the development of Grover Cleveland Alexander, one of the greatest pitchers of all time. Pat Moran became the Phillies manager in 1915 and led the team to their first pennant. Having found the ideal card to keep Doty Paskert company, I gave the dealer a crisp Andrew Jackson for the pair, a hearty handshake, and left with a crapulent smile worthy of C. Montgomery Burns. Excellent. Running low on cash, I stopped at one more tail on the way out. This dealer I knew. I'd seen him a number of times at various shows, and I'd bought many cards from him. Hey, Philly's guy, he called out. We shook hands, exchanged pleasantries. He said, I was hoping I'd see you here. I've got one for you. And he went into his personal bag. After having seen, no less than an hour before... The ugly part of the baseball card hobby, here I was, experiencing the very best of it. A baseball card dealer found a card somewhere out there, and he thought of me. So he tucked it away in his personal stash, just in case he ran into the Phillies guy at the next show. My faith in humanity was restored. What card did he pull out of that bag? Wouldn't you know, it was another T205, gold border, sweet capital back, Fred Jacklich. One T205 is an oddity. Two is a pair. Three, that's a collection. 
Fred Jacklich had two stints with the Phillies from 1900 to 1902 and 1907 to 1910. He later went on to coach at Rutgers University from 1926 to 1931, special to me in that I'm an alumnus of Rutgers. We chewed the fat for a few minutes about baseball, quickly, easily, and mutually agreed on a fair price for the card, and shook hands. His table was busy, and he needed to attend to other customers, and it was time for me to depart in any case. See you next time, he said with a wink. And he will. He didn't have to do that, but he did it anyway. Baseball card people are, with one very big recent exception, the very best people. A big hobby that feels small, with small cards that feel big. Proudly wearing my Philly shirt and carrying a new stash of cardboard jewels, I hit the road, with a few less dollars, a few more cards, and new baseball card stories to tell. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there on the card show floor. And tune in next time for more baseball card stories, legends, and lore.